Senator Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. Mr. Mnuchin, welcome. Um, Mr. Chairman, during his campaign for president, Donald Trump told us that at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, the very, very rich are getting richer, almost everybody else is getting poorer, that he, Donald Trump, was going to stand up for the working families of this country. He was going to take on the establishment, and he was especially harsh on his words about Wall Street greed. He said he was going to drain the swamp. He said, and I quote, we can't fix a rigged system by relying on the people who rigged it in the first place, end of quote. He said, I'm not going to let Wall Street get away with murder. Wall Street has caused tremendous problems for us, end of quote. That's an exact quote from Donald Trump. He included language, pushed language into the Republican platform, which I happen to agree with, stating, quote, we support reinstating the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, which prohibits commercial banks from engaging in high-risk investment, end of quote. He said that he was the only person in America, the only one, who could take on the corrupt political and economic establishment. He said, quote, we are going to send the special interest packing, and we are going to once again have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, end of quote. Wow. Those are really dramatic statements. Here we have a president who ran. He was going to take on Wall Street. He was going to stand up for the working families of this country. And those words, no doubt, must have gotten the billionaire class really, really nervous because he was saying all these things during the campaign. Unfortunately, as I think most Americans understand, all of those words of Donald Trump were never meant to be taken seriously. It was just campaign rhetoric, good rhetoric, I must say, to get votes, but nothing that he ever had any intention of actually implementing. Donald Trump talked about draining the swamp, talked about taking on Wall Street, but he now has more billionaires in his administration than any president in American history. Funny way to, to take on the establishment by having more billionaires in your administration than any president in American history. His administration, this is the guy who's gonna take on Wall Street, is filled with executive after executive from Goldman Sachs, one of the largest, the most powerful financial institutions on Wall Street. His chief economic advisor is Gary Cohn. Chief economic advisor Gary Cohn, who was the president of Goldman Sachs, and a man who received a $285 million severance package. His treasury secretary, and we're delighted that you're with us today, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, worked at Goldman Sachs for 17 years. Mr. Chairman, one of the great scandals of our time, which is still impacting millions of Americans today, is that virtually every major Wall Street institution was involved in reckless, irresponsible, and illegal behavior, which led to the great crash of 2008, which caused massive unemployment in this country. People lost their homes. People lost their savings. We had financial institutions who sold mortgage-backed securities that were worthless while they ripped off low-income and working families throughout the country. In fact, among virtually every other major financial institution, as a result of their illegal activities, Goldman Sachs alone paid a fine of more than five billion dollars to the federal government. But instead of reforming Wall Street, which is what the president said he would do, instead of reinstating Glass-Steagall as he promised he would do during the campaign, President Trump endorsed a bill that passed the House last week that would deregulate Wall Street, increasing the odds of yet another taxpayer bailout even bigger than 2008. Campaign for Glass-Steagall, now he is deregulating Wall Street. In my view, if financial institutions are too big to fail, they are too big to exist. It is time to break them up. Now, Mr. Chairman, with a cabinet of billionaires, it should come as no surprise that the budget that President Trump has proposed has been written by the billionaire class and for the billionaire class. Frankly, this budget that we have recently received is the most anti-working class budget, the most destructive budget in the modern history of America.
This budget follows the, in the footsteps of the Trump-Ryan health care bill, which gives massive tax breaks to the people on top and throws 23 million Americans off of health insurance, cuts Medicaid by over $800 billion funds Planned Parenthood. The Trump budget, and I hope to be questioning Mr. Mnuchin about this, would cause devastating pain to tens of millions of families in our country by cutting nutrition programs, by slashing Head Start, by making massive cuts to affordable housing, by doing away with programs, life and death programs for working families. But guess what? Guess what? As part of the budget, we're looking at $3 trillion in tax breaks over a 10-year period to the top 1%. So the very rich get richer. Working class in this country is shrinking. Trump budget gives unbelievable tax breaks to the wealthiest family in this country. It is an immoral budget. It is a budget that must be defeated by the United States Congress. Mr. Mnuchin, as you know, the estate tax applies only to the top two-tenths of 1%. 99.8% 9 of Americans will not gain a nickel if the estate tax were repealed. So my first question is, why do you think at a time when the middle class is shrinking and millions of our families are struggling to put bread on the table, they're working 50, 60, 70 hours a week, not uncommon in my state of Vermont for people who are working three jobs. Why do you think it is a good idea to throw 23 million people off of health insurance, to cut nutrition programs for low-income pregnant women and their babies? Why do you think it's a good idea to make massive cuts in LIHEAP so that older people in Vermont can stay warm in the wintertime? Why do you think it's a good idea when all over this country people are paying 50, 60 percent of their limited incomes for housing? Why do you think it's a good idea to make massive cuts in those programs and yet, with regard to repealing the estate tax, give the wealthiest family in this country, the Walton family, up to a $52 billion tax break? Do you think most Americans who are struggling think it's a great idea to cut programs that impact working families and give unbelievable tax breaks to the wealthiest families in America? Uh, well, th thank you for your question. Let me first assure you that as part of tax reform, the President very much wants us to have a middle-income tax cut that's focused on spurring the economy. Now, as it relates to the estate tax, uh, the super-rich have plenty of gimmicks so that they don't need to pay the estate tax. This is about eliminating the estate tax so that Americans who have built businesses and created jobs and want to pass those companies on and continue their farms and continue their industry don't have to sell those businesses to pay the death tax. No, actually, that's not what it's about. In fact, my good friend, uh, uh, Chairman Enzi, mentioned ranchers and farmers, and we're all concerned about it. Last study I saw thought that maybe 50, 5 zero ranchers and farmers may be impacted. What this is really about, and we should be honest about it, is that people like the Koch brothers, second wealthiest family in America, have spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to get benefits like this. So do you really think when you talk about families like the Koch brothers and the Walton family, and by the way, the Trump family, who would get something like a $4 billion tax break, do you really think that it makes sense, again, to cut programs that people desperately need, need to stay alive and give massive tax breaks to the children of the wealthiest family in this country? Well, I'm not going to comment on the specifics of the Waltons or the Kochs. I'm sure they've done plenty of estate planning, and uh, they've both been very philanthropic uh, in their charitable contributions. What this budget is about, and our tax reform is about creating 3 percent growth, and what this budget is about is sending a message that, one, the Trump administration believes we should have a balanced budget, and two, we've made very difficult decisions, and I understand some of those programs I agree with are quite worthy, but we've made very difficult decisions to fund the military to protect Americans. We've I, I apologize for interrupting. We, we just don't have a lot of time, so please accept okay. my apology here. You made difficult decisions to give tax breaks to multi-billionaires and to cut programs for working families. I don't think those are difficult decisions. I think those are immoral decisions. Let me ask you another question. President Trump campaigned 
on uh, the fact that he was going to take on Wall Street. He supported a 21st century Glass-Steagall Act. That's what he said during the campaign. Uh, you just recently uh, introduced a report uh, on uh, Wall Street reform. Can you tell me uh, where I could find the establishment of a 21st century Glass-Steagall Act, which would separate commercial banking from risky investment banking, something the president campaigned on? What page might I find? Hey, uh, first of all, let me just comment that uh, I think, as you know, I had the pleasure of traveling the country with the president. During the campaign, I met with hundreds and hundreds of small and medium-sized businesses. During the campaign, we specifically said that we believed in a 21st century Glass-Steagall that was differentiated from what was the Republican Party view of Glass-Steagall. Well, well, okay. Let I me get this right. I don't mean to interrupt you, Mr. Chairman. Well, but you are, you're telling you are me, interrupting me. You're not letting me finish my comment. But I have very limited time. And what you're saying is that the language that Trump put into the Republican platform is not really the language that he believed in. Again, let me be clear. Uh, the president did not put everything into the Republican platform. There was the Republican platform, and there was the Trump position, which I was very involved in. And I had the pleasure of speaking to Senator Warren about this when I testified uh, several weeks ago, and I followed up with her office and had a personal meeting with her, and I explained to her the difference between what we had thought of as a 21st century Glass-Steagall and Glass-Steagall, and made it very clear in my last testimony in front of the Senate that the president did not support breaking up big banks. We think that that would hurt the economy, that would ruin liquidity in the market. What we are focused on is safe and prudent regulation for the large banks so we don't have taxpayer risk. In other words, the campaign, the Trump campaign, campaigned on reinstating Glass-Steagall. No, no, it did not. It never campaigned on that, Senator. And oh, it was just respect. put it into the Republican platform. I stand corrected. Again, we differentiated and we were very clear. And as I had said to Senator Warren, if we believed in it, we would have not labeled it a 21st century. That's the name of legislation right now. And I Congress, understand as that's you know. hers, and that's uh, an unfortunate coincidence. Right. 